That said, let me welcome you to St. James Chapel for the first of our uh, 2009 Fireside Chats. Thank you for coming on such a frigid evening. Uh, my name is Sue DiLorenzo, and I'd like to uh, welcome you uh, along with uh, John and Gloria Golden, who are my co-chairs. As many of you know, uh, the chats began as part of St. James's bicentennial celebration in 2011. Uh, it was an effort to bring St. James history and that of uh, local happenings uh, topics to not only our parishioners, but also uh, the community. And it was so hugely successful that it is continuing right to this day. So it is an annual series and we're glad that you're part of it tonight. Tonight we'll be learning about John Burroughs, American essayist and naturalist and Hudson Valley resident. River B, his Hudson Valley home, is located on the river in West Park, directly across from Hyde Park. I guess it can be said that except for the river being between us, we would be considered neighbors. Just a mile west of River B, Burroughs built his rustic retreat, which he called Slab Sides, where he entertained many notables of the time, including Theodore Roosevelt, John Muir, Walt Whitman, Henry Ford, and many others, just to name a few. Our speaker tonight is Joan Burroughs, president of the John Burroughs Association. Joan is the great-granddaughter of the famous essayist and naturalist. As president of the association, her mission is to promote and bring to life the legacy, writing, and natural world of the naturalist writer. Joan grew up exploring the Hudson Valley and nearby uh, Catskills during her annual vacation with her family at River Bay, her great-grandfather's 19th century fruit farm estate on the river. She also spent many years as a Girl Scout, which heightened her love for the outdoors and for nature. In college, Joan was a mathematics major and earned a Master of Business Administration degree in finance. Following a career in corporate and private banking, she returned to her long-standing interests in conservation and the legacy of her great-grandfather. Joan now works to preserve and enhance the local land for public enjoyment and to pro promote engagement in nature. As a result of her efforts, she was awarded the Wallkill Valley Land Trust Conservation Award in 2013. She's currently working on developing the regional John Burroughs Black Creek Trail in Ulster County, which I'm sure we're going to hear more about. So please welcome Joan Burroughs. Good evening, I'm so pleased to be here. Um, and you're right, we were neighbors. In, in fact, um, Sue told me the, the story of um, how my church, Ascension Church, came to be um, in West Park. Um, excuse me? How do I turn that up louder? Do you, can you do this for me? Push it closer to her. Like this? Is that better? Okay, you do it. So my church in West Park is the Ascension, Church of the Ascension, and my grandfather, Julian, was on the vestry there. And I understand it came to be because the Episcopalians over there would take the boat over to St. James, and one time they lost it. Did they lose the whole boat full? They lost a lot of people in some bad weather, and so they built Ascension. Um, and we are neighbors um, with the Vanderbilt Mansion. Um, as Sue said, our view is the Vanderbilt Mansion. And it's been great, except for one little pesky maple tree that's blocking the, the mansion. But uh, we have a better view of that, that building for the bachelors. Um, and unfortunately, the people at the Vanderbilt Mansion, their view is John Burroughs' humble estate. Um, but during the winter, back when the, the, um, the river would freeze, he and many others would walk back and forth. And at some point, he became acquainted with um, Louise and Frederick Vanderbilt, although I don't think it was during the winter because I believe they didn't come during the winter. But um, 
Louise gave John one of his favorites dog, favorite dogs, and I don't know if that's Nip or, or um, Laddie, but um, they were neighbors. I want to, um, is Bill Urban here? Well, I was hoping he would be here. He probably knows more about John Burroughs than all of us put together. He published my aunt's, um, Elizabeth Burroughs Kelly's books. But um, I'm really pleased that Ann Ritchie is here. Um, she is giving a talk on the religion of John Burroughs next week at Bard. And so you could ask her about that. I'm not going to go near that tonight because she's the authority on that. And Linda Alfano, who um, is very important to the John Burroughs Association, does an awful lot for us. And Dave Linderman. Thank you for coming. And um, he, he's a, an amazing trail volunteer and, and went knee deep in, in mud in front of slab sites trying to drag out old logs. But thank you all for coming tonight on this really frigid night. I'm sure you had other things to do and fires to sit by, but um, I'm really glad you're here and I'm really glad to be here. So I'm glad you mentioned the John Burroughs Black Creek Trail. It's a very special project initiative for us. The John Burroughs Association, with our partners, Scenic Hudson and the DEC, are building a trail, 11 mile long trail, of the length of Black Creek. It's Black Creek in Ulster County, right across from you, is, is really one of the last remaining pristine creeks that flow into the, the Hudson. And um, it will be a, a bike paddle hike trail. It, it crosses the um, Empire State Trail and will connect with your Duchess Rail Trail via the walkway. And there's a brochure on that, our plan over there. I have a display table if you'd like to take a look during the reception. Um, got some neat things about Burroughs. I also want to say just a few things about the John Burroughs Association. It aims to bring to life the legacy writing and natural world of John Burroughs. Not to glorify him, but to really use Burroughs as a vehicle to access nature. And we do that in, with real world experiences in the natural world at slab sides and the 200 acre nature sanctuary and also through annual literary awards recognizing the best in nature writing since 1926 the association has been giving the john burroughs medal the bronze john burroughs medal to the most distinguished book of natural history writing we also recognize exceptional works nature books for young readers with multiple River Bee Awards and we also recognize the outstanding published nature essay. And there's a display of all the winners from last year so I encourage you to check them out. We're really proud of this this um, program of ours that um, really supports the the undersung um, community of nature writers. So we talked about his legacy. What What, what is his legacy? They're, they're multiple, it's multifaceted, but I'd like to just um, address three, three pieces of his legacy. And, and the first one, perhaps the most important, is he created the modern nature essay, and that's what you read today. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Also, he was significantly in influential in the emerging conservation movement, the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. And we'll also talk about that. And the third piece that um, is the most practical is that his essays endure. You can read his essays and still get a great deal out of them. So how many here, we have how many people? This is a, this is a wonderful crowd. The last count it was 93, but more have come in, so it's more than that. So this isn't a quiz, but how many, you've heard of John Burroughs? You may have read some of his essays? A little bit? Maybe opened a book? And maybe you've been to Slab Sides? But then you probably are way ahead of me. Um, no, I, I was just there the other day. We're working on parking. Um, so many of you, I'm guessing, have, have your own Burroughs story. And I'd love to hear them, maybe in the question and answer time or, or in the reception. Um, I find a lot of people, you know, keep him to themselves. And, and I'd love to hear your stories. So I'm going to have to change this now, right? I think I was supposed to change this. He looks a little stern. Usually he, um, he looks more like Santa Claus. He did not like to pose for portraits, for photographs, and that's why you rarely see him smiling. And this is some of the, the land around slab sides with the, the, the ferns in front. This is the South um, Pond Trail. In his day, Burroughs was the most popular author of any genre. 
selling one and a half million books, which was a lot for back then. And, and we won't get into why we don't know of him so well today, but, but we want to take a look at who he was and how did he come to write about nature. This is Old Clump. Burroughs was born April 3rd, 1837. I'm thinking I should have a pointer. But um, you see that the, the, the fields there, the green fields on that, well, the, the part that is still trees, and you take the left side and come down, you might see a house. That was the, the home um, where he was born. He wasn't born in that house. He was born in the house that preceded that. His family rebuilt it. And then you go along to the right, there's the hay barn study. Where's the pointer? Here? What would I do? Okay, this never mind. Um, uh, <laughs> so his both both sets of grandparents had emigrated from Connecticut after the end of the Revolutionary War, and they were part of the first wave of settlers. And they were called settlers. Um, and before they came, the cat skills were all wilderness. But you don't want cats. You don't want to live with cats. And so they they tried to make it safe. They cut down the trees and and tamed it, and of course exploited its natural resources because that was the mindset then. You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, have any other reason to, to think any, wouldn't have any reason to think any other way. And so John grew up when the tanning industry that relied on the hemlock bark extracted from the hemlock trees to, to tan leather, um, that, that industry was just getting established in the Catskills. He was the seventh of 10 children. With three older brothers, we imagined that the heavier work fell to them. And so he had more time to be idle. And throughout his life, in his writing, he is a self-professed loafer. He did work really hard at writing, though, so, so don't miss that. But the heavy work, he was not so keen on. And so he had time to, to um, absorb the sights and sounds of the, the Catskills. He would go berry picking with his mother up old clump and go fishing with her father in one of the streams around there, Meeker Creek or West Settlement Creek. A large singular boulder, that thing on the left, um, perched on the side of old clump, um, behind, almost behind the, the family's home, um, is, is where he would spend idle moments. Not all idle moments, but this is a particular nifty spot because you could look out at the, um, it was on, his home was on the western shoulder of the Catskills and he could look east and see the highest mountains including Slide. And he called it, we all call it, Boyhood Rock. And you can see in front of that, that was his burial spot. He's buried there. And so this photograph is taken um, 1930s, 40s perhaps. His quest to read and learn was a unique trait in his family. Nobody else, his father read the Bible and I believe the newspaper, um, but they were not readers or learners especially. He went to a one room schoolhouse. And he borrowed books that he could. And then with the money he earned selling maple sugar candies that he made um, every April, he would buy books. In fact, he bought a book from his classmate, Jay Gould, who went on. He took a different turn in life. Um, and, and some believe to be a good writer, I believe, to be a good writer, you have to read good writing. And he did. He had a voracious reading appetite. He was determined not to be a dairy farmer. This is so much work. All the hay business, and if it's going to hail, what do you do with the hay? And, and then the cows in and out, and the milking, all for butter. And that was the family's cash crop. So in 1854, when he was just 17, he left home to teach. And for the first two years, he'd teach for a term and then earn enough money to go to school. And I think that was Cooperstown Seminary was one of them. And, and then he'd teach for a term and then earn enough money to go to school again. And um, there's a fellow in, in High Falls who's researched his, um, his teaching career. And he says that these schools were like college preparatory. But he really wanted to learn. When he was seven of his nine assignments, uh, appointments, were in Ulster County, but one was in Buffalo Grove, just outside of Chicago. And there, in a bookstore, he discovered Emerson. So he bought Emerson's um, two-volume 
set of nature essays, and he, he dug into his philosophy and writing style, and he began to emulate him, which got him in a little bit of trouble. But later he would refer to Emerson as his spiritual father. And when he's in Chicago, this photograph is taken, and if you put your hand over the clothes, he's pretty cute. And I don't you think we, we took this photograph when we, we did a, um, a, a talk over at Poughkeepsie Day School. The hair works, the hair works now, today. But it didn't work for Ursula North. And, and so he comes back from Chicago, marries Ursula, Ursula North, and um, she had him cut his hair. I know, it's such a shame. Um, while teaching near West, uh, West Point Military Academy, he discovered in the library a book of Audubon's bird prints, and he was just spellbound. He had never seen, imagined birds as being so beautiful. And in his notebooks that he'd been keeping since he left home, he began to, to write down his notes about bird sightings and observations. So he's getting into birds. And still teaching, he slowly became successful in placing a few pieces in couple literary magazines and weekly newspapers. And in a publication that ran one of his pieces also ran something by Walt Whitman. And again, he's spellbound by, um, by Walt Whitman. And um, he was taken by the expression and the challenging nature of Whitman's writing, and he became a fan. So after 10 years of teaching in 1863, the country's fighting the Civil War, prices are going up, and he's not able to negotiate an increase in his salary. A friend of his, um, a teaching friend, um, had moved to Washington and was urging him to come because there are plenty of jobs, we're having a war, there's lots of jobs, and besides, Walt Whitman comes in my shop all the time. And so that did it, he and Ursula moved to Washington, Burroughs, meets Walt Whitman and he gets a job as a clerk in the United States Treasury. It's Walt Whitman. He meets Walt Whitman and they quickly develop an intellectual camaraderie and a lifelong, lifelong friendship. And Burroughs was still keeping his notebooks, still writing observations, his thoughts, and he was writing, but his writing wasn't going anywhere. Whitman encouraged, as we would say today, he told him to find his own voice. And so Whitman tells him to find his own voice and write what you know. And so John did. The other reason why Washington, being in Washington was so important to, to Burroughs is that the job at the Treasury building, building left him not fully occupied and likely miserable. This country boy is sitting in front of an iron vault, and we know in his essays he refers to the iron vault in, in two essays, and we know the vault was in the, the basement of the Treasury Building, and we imagine it didn't have windows. So here's this country kid sitting there, just miserable, and, and not fully occupied, as any good bureaucrat um, would, could attest to. Um, so he's out of his element, and he longed for the hills of his Catskill home. and so he began to write, and he wrote with deep emotion about the thing he knew best, and that was birds. So his first essay, writing in his free time at work, Burroughs began an essay chronicling the progression of birds arriving in spring and summer. His essay, With the Birds, was published in the lead article of the May 1865 Atlantic Monthly, and it's written in first person, in Burroughs' voice, and it was the first nature essay in this modern form. And just a, a minute about um, Emerson and Thoreau, they wrote about nature in essay form, predominantly third person and heavily philosophical. Burroughs writes third person, and he is, he is showing you nature personally. And more essays came with fresh material from his Catskill mountain tramps with friends during the summer. He would go up to the Catskills, to his Roxbury home in the summer. And these and the essays that followed, Burroughs took his readers to the hemlock forest, the farm fields and woodlands, and even just outside his door, and he gave the readers the ability and belief that they too were part of the, the landscape, and he used simple, vivid language. And this became Burroughs' unique style. His essays were very accessible, as they are today, easy to understand, yet beautiful 
and vivid in describing an observation or a feeling, and the readers could relate to that. And they too could experience what he wrote. And these essays found a ready audience and were and the leading publications of the time clamored for more. And so this is, um, while he was in Washington, Houghton Mifflin collected his essays into two volumes, and Wake Robin was first published in 1871, and for that the title was changed to The Return of the Birds. And all but one of the essays was previously published in magazines. The last one, um, he wrote specially for this, this volume, An Invitation. He's inviting his readers to come study birds. He called it um, being an ornithologist, but it really meant being a, what we call a bird watcher today. And people began to take notice of his nature essays. So after 10 years in, in Washington, Lincoln was dead, Whitman had left, and so Burroughs followed in 1873. When he and Ursula were living, actually where I think, think a Senate building is now, um, they, they had a plot of land and they kept a cow for dairy, they took in a border, and they also um, grew a lot of their produce. And he was able to save half his salary, he says. And so with his savings, he purchased a small fruit farm on the banks of the Hudson River, and he built a large stone house and it's called, it and the property are called Riverby, by the river. And here he is a few years after he bought the, um, the property and built Riverby. He has the beard, but it's not white yet. And here he is, and this is, he's older here, but I wanted to show you um, the place we chopped wood and where he would boil the maple sap every spring. Behind it is the study um, that he built well, I haven't gotten to his son yet, but he built it when his son was three and he started roaming around the house and he needed a place to write. And Jeff Walker, a Burroughs scholar at Vassar, says that all his editing took place in that study. And across from it, you see the summer house where he would entertain unexpected guests and, and other expected guests. And he would write on the arm of a big, um, his big rocking chair. And... This, um, the, it was a fruit farm. It, he grew table grapes for the New York City market. And here he is pruning. And, and this one, off to the right of his elbow, I think might be barred rock somewhere over there. I didn't think I wanted to do that yet. Um, readers started coming to see him. And many, he had many influential, what is going on? I didn't want to do that yet. Here we go. Um, and Whitman did come and visit three times, but he didn't get to slab sides. It wasn't built before he died. But he and John would tramp around the, the woods to the west in the area where slab size was built. And Burroughs called that land Whitman land because it was rough and untamed like his friend Walt Whitman. And it's it's a swath of land um, from Chopinique down to Illinois Mountain and Highland, and it's really dramatic. We we offer a geology ramble on um, the fourth Saturday in September that really explains the you know how it came to be like that, and so you could check that out. Um, five years after moving to Riverby, his son Julian was born in 1878, and Julian would go on to Harvard and then settle and raise his own family on a piece of the Riverby property that his father gave him. I want to take just a minute to talk about Slide Mountain. If you know the essay, The Heart of the Southern Catskills, the, it's a horse with his head down, the shoulders showing. I don't know if you can quite see that. Paul Misko took this photograph trying to get that horse shoulder thing. He wrote about, um, in 1885, he and some, some friends, um, actually a neighbor in West Park and a few others, um, went on a tramp up Slide Mountain. He had long said, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquer this mountain. I'm going up it. And, and it took him a couple years to actually do that. But they had misadventures and misadventures. And, and so the resulting essay is the heart of the Southern Catskills. And I should say just a minute, uh, just a, a word about tramps. I talk about tramps a lot. That's what he called a hike. But for him, it really wasn't a hike. It, today, it'd be what we call a bushwhack. There were no trail guides. So they go on these tramps. And so in this essay, he tells of his adventures and misadventures of this camping trip. And 
This essay made Slide Mountain a must climb for the newly arriving tourists and adventure seekers. And soon after the essay was published, Slide became so popular that in 1891, the New York State Legislature appropriated funds to build a trail up there. First state funds ever for a trail. And I think it was about $200. But, uh, but you know, this is before the art of trail building really was developed. And the trail, if you've been up there off Route 47, it's just straight up. And it's really dull. But, but you get to the top and it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And so I shouldn't say it's dull. It's, it's really, it's a good hike. Any season, it's a good hike. And on the top, there was a plaque. And how many of you have climbed, climbed slide? Great. How many are you going to climb slide? <laughs> then, then I will read you what the plaque says. It, it says it was put in um, the year after um, Burroughs died in, mem in memory of John Burroughs, who in his early writings introduced Slide Mountain to the world. He made many visits to this peak and slept several nights beneath this rock. This region is the scene of many of his essays. And then there's a little quotation, here lies, uh, here are the works of, of man dwindle um, from that, that essay. And this, it's interesting, this essay and this plaque um, are, are a magnet to, to um, Catskill hikers and sometimes um, they discover burrows through this plaque. It's, it's quite interesting. It seemed that everybody was reading Burroughs and he's, he's writing in the post-Civil War era when the country is moving quite rapidly from a rural agrarian society to industrialized urban society. People were moving off the farms into towns and cities and they missed the country. And maybe they didn't realize it until they read Burroughs. He expressed so well what was inside of them and what they were feeling. And the essays resonated with them. He was tapping into the emotions of the time while building sympathy with nature. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily sit around the, the dinner table, at the supper table, and say, Maud, did you notice how still the air was before that snowstorm last night? Or, um, you know, I was, uh, I was by that creek the other day, and I, I got so much more pleasure out of that creek than I did out of the river. You know, she'd, she'd throw the lunch pail at you. Um, and people didn't talk like that, but Burroughs did talk to them like that, and they understood what he was talking about. In his essays, Burroughs took his readers by the hand, not I mean, literally when they came to visit him, he would take them by the hand, into the woods and show them the Phoebe's nest. And, and they felt, you know, they developed a personal relationship with him through his, his writing. I want to tell you about what happened. You want to do anything about that? I want to tell you about sixth grade teacher Mary Burt in Chicago. She saw in, in um, 1895, she saw how her students paid attention and, and calmed when, um, do you want me to do anything or can you do it? Um, when, when she read Burroughs. And so she, she did battle with the um, Chicago School Board and, and ordered 30 copies of Papacton, his, his fifth collection of essays. And, um, and then 10 years later, she went to his publisher and asked if she could develop a reading primer for kids to learn to use, to learn to read. And while he fixes that, I'm gonna show you this little book. Little Nature Studies for Little People from John Burroughs, edited by Mary Burt. And so, students across the country use this for, I believe, four decades. I've, I've seen five decades. But um, what is so special about it is the, the notes um, from the notes to the teachers. And she wanted. Um, teachers and students to become naturalists, to appreciate the natural world. And she's never mind the kids learning to, students learning to read. If they're doing something they enjoy, they're gonna learn to read. And so it starts out with, with the large print, if you can see that, and, and then it gets um, smaller and smaller. It's for third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth grade. But um, these notes to the teachers are critical. Um, she tells the teachers to 
take the students outside and let them tell you what they see. And so they're, they're going to have to tell you what they see. And, and so then, then this little note, one bee, another bee, I see two bees. Has the bee a head? Does it have wings? How many? How many wings do birds have? How many legs? Compare that with a mouse. And so she's getting people, getting students to think about um, what they're looking at. So she's, they're really learning to observe nature. And this, these little reading primers launch the study of nature in schools. And we think of that, oh, sure, you're going to study nature. Of course, everybody does that. That was really radical back then. He was slowly, through, through um, these little reading primers, he was catching kids early, and he was changing attitudes about nature. So the youngsters are reading him. Older readers are, are catching his essays in the magazines, such as Century, Atlantic Monthly, Scribner's, North American Review. For 55 years, he's publishing in, in um, magazines. And then people are also reading him in his essays collected into books. Nearly 400 essays in his collected works, um, number 23 volumes. And so that's, that's a lot. Um, and it, I, I charted out the essays once. I thought I'd find a bell, I'd do a bell curve with um, you know, the numbers of essays published every year. But it was flat. Um, he was publishing, even after he died, he had things that hadn't been published. And, and they, um, they were published. So um, he was quietly, through his writing, he's quietly working his charm, building empathy with nature. And perhaps he was all the more effective because he didn't have a political point of view. He was not a fist pounder. He did not demand through his writing that the ills being brought on the earth be stopped. And he did his work gently. He simply brought a whole swath of the population along with him getting ready for conservation. Legions of his readers considered him a friend, and they wrote him, and um, they wanted to, they visited him, they wanted to, to share with him their observations, and with the man who had been guiding them through nature. And it said that Burroughs received so much mail that the little hamlet of West Park had to set up a post office, and, and they made him the first postmaster because it was his mail. <laughs> and I want to show you. I mean, it's, it's true. That little post office is still there. Um, I want to show you that this first edition of Wake Robin. I used to throw it in my backpack and go out in the woods. And then I realized how special it was. The the owner of this book um, was in Michigan, and he made an index of all the bird references. This handmade little index. And then he wrote Burroughs, and we know he wrote Burroughs because Burroughs writes him back. And inside this little used store book is a little um, letter. Dear Sir, the Phoebe note you heard was a chickadee, of course. I've heard it hundreds of times. He goes on to describe the, the, um, the, the song. And then the fellow does the song notes. He writes, I don't know if you can see the musical you know, notes of the, I don't know if he did the Phoebe or the chickadee, but um, that, there it is. Um, because so many people came to see him, there was really building pressure on the home. Once there was a lady who came up from New York City, total stranger, she stayed for two weeks. And Burroughs, is, you read him and you get to know him, he's a gentle soul, so sort of a type B personality. And, and, but this is a problem in the household. So, I, I don't know where she stayed, but, um, but total strangers would show up and they'd just go on about you know, what they were seeing and they were so excited. Let me put these over here. So, so in, um, to help solve the problem and gain a simpler life, because this, this stone house was really a little too fancy for him, in 1895, he bought property at the base of a rock cliff near Black Creek, about a mile from Riverby. He built a two-story cabin and named it Slabsides. You know why it's named Slabsides? Dave and you three can't answer. Because it's covered with, with bark that is the first slab of, of the log at the mill. Um, I think that study that he, I showed you earlier was a practice for slab sides. The, um, the bark there is vertical. And yes, he was going to entertain at slab sides. And here he is. Um, 
he also grew celery, three acres of celery, which was probably just as much work as being a dairy farmer. But uh, he wanted to, he needed to supplement his income because he couldn't um, quite support um, his family with just his his writing income. And you can see that the the area in front of slab sides was just flat, right? That was not it's not meant to be monkey where where he's he's standing. Um, the water now flows from that <coughs> celery area um, in front of the cabin. And the interior is pretty much the way he left it. Um, when he was last there in the fall of 1920. As Burroughs' popularity grew, the cabin set within Whitmanland attracted more people. John Muir was one of his overnight guests, and his journals say that um, he they talked so much they forgot to eat. <laughs> That's right. And I wanted to show you, this is not, um, this does not tell the story of John Muir, but I wanted to show you a sample of his journal. His journals, um, are all at Vassar, and uh, under Jeff Walker, he's having them transcribed. You can go online today and see them like that. And most of the years, um, he's had his interns transcribe them. So you, if you don't want to struggle through his handwriting, um, you can see the, the type version. And I understand they've just gotten a grant to finish that. And so in the next year or so, we should have the whole set of them. So he entertained so many people. His guest books bulged with nearly 7,000 signatures. And so Slapside was most active for 15 years, but he still would go there the last 10 years of his life. And so that averages, in 25 years, that averages 200 a year. And that's just the people who made it inside. And I don't know how many guests you get a year, but 200 is a lot. <laughs> but I want to show you, um, and and so the the um, the women of Vassar's Wake Robin Club um, were, were particular fans, and they made trips to slab sites often, and regularly had their photos taken here. And I, I could have put up a series of, of photographs of the Vassar women, and it's sort of a, the history of fashion is is really fascinating. But today, today, this is these are the Vassar students, and they they came uh, with their. Um, um, environmental science class, they come every year, and they also helped us with the, the stuff in front of the cabin. Another one of the, probably the most important visitor to Slab Sides was President Theodore Roosevelt and Edith. In 1903, the presidential launch came up from the city and stopped at the West Park dock, and um, Burroughs, who, you know, he knew everybody in the, the, the community. They all came, everybody in the town came. He introduced them all around. And I think it was in his journal, he said, I sure hope my neighbor across the river notices whose boat is here. <laughs> because he's seeing all these yachts and all this stuff going on. But um, then they, they walked up to, to Slab Sides, and he typically would serve his guests brigand steak, which is basically shish kebab. But I understand today he, he cooked a chicken, they had fresh peas, and then they walked over to Riverby and had ice cream with Mrs. Burroughs. And I, I want to just tell you, I don't want to make too much of Roosevelt, but it really was a very important relationship. Roosevelt and Burroughs. Historian Douglas Brinkley believes a most significant friendship in the annals of American conservation history was forged in March 1889 when the 30-year-old self-taught naturalist Theodore Roosevelt sought out the 51-year-old Burroughs. And they had a, a close friendship and, and they shared a, a love of, of nature and Darwinism. And it is said Brinkley believes that um, you can see a turn in in, Bur in Roosevelt's writing, and he was a voracious writer. Um, and you can you can see just a, a more gentle approach to nature, rather than, well, he had a very aggressive approach to to wildlife, um, big game. And um, they went on. I think of them as probably competitive bird walks because Roosevelt's like, I see that, I see that. I saw that first. And, and Burroughs didn't care. He's, he's very gentle. But Roosevelt would typically get a couple of birds, new birds out of their walks and could go off and, and um, be proud of that. Um, but their, their um, bird walks would um, were at the White House, Oyster Bay, and once at Pine Knot, um, the presidential retreat in just outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, which is said to look remarkably like slab sites. I tried to get there once, and, and it's private property now. But um, 
I want to tell you also that um, in 1903, that was a big year for, for Burroughs and Roosevelt, um, the president's 12-year-old son, Teddy, came for a long weekend to stay with Om John. Um, this was Roosevelt's nickname for John, um, Dutch for Uncle John. And the resulting essay from that is is Babes in the Woods, and Burroughs talks about their their uh, adventures um, near slab sides. And, and he does say in his journal that um, young Teddy had every bit as energy, uh, every, was every bit as energetic as his father. And he's probably surprised he didn't kill himself. So also in that year, um, Burroughs accepted the... Um, Roosevelt's invitation to go to Yellowstone National Park with him. And Ken Burns used Burroughs' first-hand account of, in, a, in his documentary film, Our National Parks, and there they are at the train station just outside of, of Yellowstone. Civil War industrialization um, was depleting the natural resources throughout the country, and closer to home, Burroughs had seen the degradation of much of the Catskills. He was an optimist, but um, you could see sort of a slight turn in his essays with increasing concern for the earth, fearing that the earth would become a sucked orange and challenge science to improve and beautify the earth, not to deface and exhaust it. Burroughs had witnessed firsthand the pending extinction of the passenger pigeon at a time when the populations of free-ranging free buffalo and other wild game were being decimated and um, so he, he gently criticized the sportsmen and showed empathy with um, the hunted game in a particular essay. Um, he told the story, theoretically, that a sportsman had told him that he had been tracking a buck and was along, it was challenging and difficult, and then he got the, the buck in his sights and he missed the shot, and then he, he went after it again, and then he had, a, he had a pretty clean shot, and the buck turned his head toward him, and they, they met eye to eye, but he shot him, he pulled the trigger, and he had terrible, he was sobbing over this um, poor dead buck, and, and, um, and just feeling very remorseful, and he, he, theoretically he tells Burroughs this story, and, and so Burroughs doesn't scold the hunter, but he tells this story through the voice of, of a hunter. And um, he would only agree to be vice president of the newly organized Audubon Society if they would take a stand against the plumers. And the plumers were killing the birds, um, particularly down in Pelican Island um, in Florida, for their feathers for the ladies' hats. And the feathers are the most beautiful when the birds are on the nest, when they're the most vulnerable. And, and so again, he's not going out and pounding his fist, you've got to stop this. Um, but through the Audubon Society, he gets them to take a stand. He was really, he had a gentle personality, he was not generally combative. Except there's this thing called the, the nature faker, but we won't go get into that when he took um, exception to people who wrote about nature and gave them um, human traits. And that was quite a brew, but that, that was, he felt very strongly about that. Burr's role was to bring America to embrace nature and gently raise its consciousness about the importance of the natural world. And he delivered popular support through this whole reading population, he delivered popular support that could be translated into votes that were essential to the, to the success in getting conservation measures through Congress. The Lacey Act of 1900 was the first federal law to protect wildlife. And it was a battle, just like today. I don't know if it's any worse or easier than today. Um, but they, they had to fight the ranchers who were taking their longhorn sheep up the slopes of Yosemite, the telegraph companies who were shooting off, uh, killing off buffalo because the buffalo would rub up against the telephone, uh, telegraph lines, and then the, the train lobby. And, and so it was a big battle. But the times had changed, and, and, and Burroughs was in part responsible for that. So we're going to take a different turn here. Um, by the 1900s, Burroughs had become a celebrity and a doting grandfather. And this is his first grandchild, Elizabeth Betty, and on his shoulders in Woodland Valley. And that's a, a place that he would return to time and time again. And then um, with Betty on the right and Ursi, Ursula, his second grandchild, um, at the well at Riverby. And he was still riding at slab sides. 
and I forget the year, we, we took a magnifying, actually we took the, this comes from Clifton Johnson's archives at um, the Jones Library in Amherst, and they were able to determine the date on that calendar over there. But, um, but you can see the mess, things piled up. In the last two decades of his life, he received many invitations to edit books and write introductions to publications, give talks, attend events, and to travel. And he was um, somehow talked into going to Jamaica one February. He took Julian along, who's a grown man then. Julian took a lot of photographs. Um, but the resulting essay was a lost February. So he, he didn't think it was worth going to Jamaica. And he was really a man for New York. So he went on um, the Alaska Harriman Expedition with all the scientific luminaries of the time and wrote the narrative of the trip. It's, it's Green Alaska, and it's in the collection Near and Far. And um, that's Burroughs. They call them the two Johnnies, Burroughs and Muir. And I believe they're, they're near Muir Glacier. And just to, to point out how, how he felt about New York, he, he goes to Alaska, and the first bird he writes about is the robin because he, he knows it, he loves the robin. And, and with, um, with Muir, he explores the petrified forest, Yosemite, and the Grand Canyon as, as Muir's guest. And this is right at the, um, the Grand Canyon, at the abyss. And, and um, you can see after he's, he's, he only knew the cat skills, these nice roundy green mounds, and, and he goes out west, and the dramatic Rockies really made an impression on him. And you see in his writing, he begins to write more about geology, and a couple of essays, The Divine Abyss, about the Grand Canyon, and primal forces. And this before we, this is before we knew about tectonic plates, and he's writing about primal forces, and that is a really neat essay. And beginning in 1916, at 79, with friends Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, and Harvey Sto Firestone, Burroughs went on several elaborate, elegant camping trips, motoring in the caravan of Ford cars. And they call themselves the Four Vagabonds. And, and this, I believe this is, is um, 1918, this trip. They seem to go every other year. And then here they are at the dining tent. And, and, um, and so just a quick story about Henry Ford. He was um, an amateur birder, and um, so was um, Edison. And um, Ford's wife, Claire, had given him a set of Burroughs books, and he wanted to meet Burroughs. And so what do you think he did? What? He gave him a car. Of course, he gave him a car. And the debonair Henry Ford gave him a car. And he gave him a total of three cars. The last car was my father's, and, and um, we were talked out of it. And it, it was restored and is now at the Dearborn Museum. I don't think it's on display anymore, but they probably have so many cars. Um, so um, over the years, um, actually, you know, some. I want to tell you one story. Um, Ford was so devoted to Burroughs, which is so curious. Um, in his later years, when, when Burroughs would be in Washington, D.C., um, Ford would always give him a driver, and you know, car and a driver to get him around. And um, um, some of the letters from Ford um, are at Vassar um, that, that talk about the parts for these cars. And uh, when he first gave him the first car, he sent an instructor that taught Burroughs and Julian how to drive. Um, and that was a good thing um, that Julian learned um, because there's you know, stories of him um, driving, uh, Burroughs driving into a, a barn. And then um, there was a Burroughs impersonator who came to Slab Sites once, and um, he had researched. Um, um, the the um, accident record of Highland, and and it seems he had a few problems, a few accidents in Highland back in 19, 1916. Um, but um, there's letters from Ford. I don't know if I'm going to recall this recall this exactly, um, but telling Burroughs that his carburetor would come on the next you know train, and and so and so would come to install it, and so here's Henry Ford telling him you know about his parts for his car. Um, and some might criticize Burroughs for his friendships with these industrialists, but as Brinkley said, 
these fellows all started out as country boys. Ford, Edison, and Farson went on to be tinkerers, and, and but Burroughs was slowly, you know, working his charm with these industrialists. This is John at Woodland Valley Creek. Um, he would often, with his son Julian, they would um, hike up Slide Mountain, and when went and from the Woodland Valley, they wouldn't go from the Route 47 way, um, but they would come up to the back door of, of Slide and became friends with the folks along Woodland Valley. Um, the Larkins Place and Roxmore, if you've gone down that road, that five mile long road into Woodland Valley. Um, Anyway, they used to go to this place called Roxmore. And so when he got too old to, to do this strenuous hike up slide, Julian would, and, and he would just um, camp by the, the creek. And we think we've identified the place where he would, um, they would stay based on a few geologic features. But um, he loved that place and, and um, he died three days shy of his 84th birthday. And there he is. We think we, he sort of got a little twinkle in his eye. But um, what I hope lingers with you is that his first-hand accounts of nature in these essays really um, created the modern nature essay. And in them, he shared um, with his readers a sense of place and purpose with the land. And the, that approach to nature had a profound impact on the emerging conservation movement. He's read by multiple generations over nearly six decades. And as Bill McKibben says, John Burroughs inspired generations of readers to head out of doors and national leaders to save land and wildlife. And lastly, his essays are still relevant today. You can read Wildlife About My Cabin and go out to slab sites and experience the same thing. Um, there's a spot where the both the northern um, warbler and the southern warbler, Louisiana water thrush, um, are there at the same time, and that's the only place Burroughs had ever seen both the northern and the southern. And birders tell me, yes, they're still there. You can go up Slide Mountain and hear the Big Nell's thrush. Maybe if you have an ornithologist who, who, who knows birds over 3,500 feet. But, um, but it's there. You can experience the same thing. And in a year or so, you can take your own copy of... Um, on and off the trail with John Burroughs, the Catskill Field Guide, with you to slide to, to the Catskills and hike the, um, you can hike the six, you will be able to hike the six essays that he wrote about the Catskills with maps. And we're, we're really excited to be working with Cornell University Press to, to, to put this book together. So this has been fun. You've been a great audience. Um, if you have any questions, you know, I'm, I'm here, and there's a display you can see there. Um, we have a couple of books, if you'd be interested. Jeff Walker's Signs and Seasons, um, hit Burroughs' fifth book that um, um, Jeff Walker has edited, and also Manifold Nature that I'm particularly proud of. Um, it um, has put together, it's published by the North American Review, and, and includes all the essays by Burroughs or about Burroughs that were published in the North American Review. So they're available. Any questions? I know you have a question. I'm not taking any from you, Dave. <laughs> what? Oh, OK. I, I have the roving mic. I have the, who has questions, all right? Yeah, did, did they have a tick problem all right, uh, already in those days? Excuse me? Did they have a problem with ticks? Not then. Not then. Okay. No, I, I believe as, as the climate warms, um, they're working their way up, up north. And Dave, I will take a question from you, but I know you're going to stump me on something. <laughs> he wanted to know what you remember as your great-grandfather and you were a little girl and how he treated you or whatever. Well, my father was 12 when his grandfather died, so I wasn't around. But um, I heard a lot of stories, and it was mostly about he knew this person, he did that, and it wasn't, um, this is by my, my aunt. And if you get Manifold Nature in the forward, I tell you that story um, of how I, I came to, um, I, I um, chaired the centennial of slab sites in 1995, and, um, and I 
have since been on a quest to understand him and put him in the context of his time. And it's been a lot of fun, and I've come to really like him. Did he ever meet up with uh, Frederick and Louise Vanderbilt? Were they ever able to meet in person? Well, we think they did because she gave him a dog. Um, but I haven't plowed through the journals about that. You could. You could research that. <laughs> no questions? And do you have something you want to say? And do you want to say anything? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Joan, do you have any record of this coming to Hyde Park, visiting Hyde Park? He was here. He was all over the place. Um, we know his books um, are in Frederick Church's library, but I don't know if you know they ever met. But the librarian has told me they're they're there. He was um, well. He would be over here because um, he would walk over here from from West Park, and his son Julian went to Riverview Academy, I think down in Poughkeepsie, and you know how rough the winters are here, and often, and you don't know how rough it is at our place, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, and, um, and so Ursula and John would often leave during the winter. And they moved over to Poughkeepsie one year, um, maybe more than one year, when, when Julian was at college. You talk about helicopter parents, Julian's at Harvard, and John goes up there and spends uh, spends the winter up there, and and so, well, it was interesting. Um, Burroughs gave a lecture, and and um, at the lecture, my great great aunt Laura was there. It was a very enthusiastic young woman, and she brought Ju um, Burroughs back to her her family. She had four sisters, and so Julian ends up marrying one of those sisters. Um, but but he did come over here. We know that, and and he would um, he was a guest of many places. He's up at the Catskill Mountain House, and and he's around in Onteora, um, um, Mohawk Mohawk Mountain House. I mean, he was very close friends with the Smileys, and then Dan Smiley was close friends with my grandfather. Um, he got around a lot, but he wasn't he wasn't a showman. He'd be invited places to talk, and he didn't really. Um, he didn't really care for the the, the smoke filled, the cigars filled rooms down in New York City, and, and often would decline invitations there. Anything else? Uh, yes. Did you have the five fishing in the Oh my, yes. Yes. Set of essays that he wrote there. Well, the question is about Burroughs writing about fly fishing. Um, the most famous as well, these six Catskill, well, five of the Catskill tramps, maybe four, were all about seeking trout. And so they'd just have an adventure, these, these guys, when they're trying to find, um, what's the one that's now private off of um, Beaverkill? Um, trying to find lakes of Thomas Lake over there. But the, the, the most prominent essay is Speckled Trout. And you'll find that in many anthologies and, um, and about fly fishing. But his, if you, um, when you get your copy of um, On and Off the Trails with John Burroughs, you can see the Never Sink and the Esopus. Those creeks are, are really um, central to those, those hikes. Do you fly fish? I, I tried it once and we caught a frog. No, no. I took my kids um, up to Roscoe when they were young and uh, tried to try to emulate that. Um, so, Dave, you had a question. You tell us about some of the wonderful things you and your organization are doing. Some of the events you've had that I've been to or that I haven't been to. Um, I know some of them are reading. Some of them are nature walks. Um, could you tell me about the events you're doing this year? Absolutely. And I don't think I brought the calendar. Um, we have our, 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 our most important events are the two Slab Sides Open House Days, the third Thursday in May and the first Saturday in October. And we have a, we feature um, a speaker. Um, and I can't tell you who we're, we're working on for May because she hasn't accepted yet. But um, we've had some really really neat speakers and we, we try not to have too much burrows. We try to, you know, talk about 
other things. Um, Nicholas Robinson most recently spoke about um, um, what he's doing in, for, for conservation internationally. Um, David Schuyler came back and talked about the nuclear power plant that might have been just at our southern boundary. But, um, but this year we, um, we do nature walks throughout the summer. Again, we're open the second and fourth Saturday, May, uh, June, July, August, September, and we typically have a nature walk beforehand. We're adding two moon walks this year if the weather cooperates. Um, and Sherry Abear is going to lead that. She's a neighbor over at Slab Size and, and does this a lot. Goes out on walks by the moon by herself anyway. Um, and, and then last year we added a mushroom walk. We do an annual February um, tree identification walk where you're um, when you're just pent up in the house and you're ready to get out and you've got cabin fever, come to this tree walk where we identify trees by their, their buds and their branching. And our, our big, big event for us is, um, is our annual literary awards. Um, the first April, rather the first Monday in April around his birthday. And that's um, that's held at the Yale Club in New York City. And it's a lot of, you know, we have the awardees and, and it's it's um, it's like a family gathering because, you know, our common interest is nature. And, 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 and it's fabulous to see the impact that these awards have on these these nature writers. Another event we added three years ago is, um, is our gala in John Burroughs' front yard. And this is, um, you know, our big fundraiser in in front of that that uh, the cabin there, and um, and we had Jay Younger, Molly Mason come and play. We have, you know, it's 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 classy with china, vintage china, and silver plated flatware, and and it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. Um, and we started this to raise money to to buy a property that John had sold to a good friend in 1896, a year after he built slab sites. He's not a hermit. He really does like people. If you met him and you became friends, you were friends for life, and he wanted people around him. So this one property um, we finally bought last, last March. Um, so we started this fundraiser to, to raise the money for it, and Cena Cutson came in and helped us close it. Um, so other fun events. Every, every April um, around Earth Day, we do a trail cleanup day. And um, we're hoping to build a new trail on Cena Cutson property um, as part of the John Burroughs Black Creek Trail. I'll loop back. What did I miss? <laughs> um, Dave asked, what's new with the John Burroughs Black Creek Trail? We, um, well, on our property, we have a grant from Greenway to put our new cedar entrance signs in, and we have finished the work on the interpretive, there are 12 interpretive signs um, along from the town of Lloyd, um, Black Creek State Forest, DEC's property, and John Burr's Nature Sanctuary, and Cena Hudson's Gordon property. So we have the 12 um, interpretive signs, we just now need money to, to build them, and so we'll be applying for a major grant um, this summer. Um, we, we're working on our parking lots. Well, there's this, the stone barns are in the way. And um, he asked, um, between slab sites of the Gordon property and to 9W, following Black Creek, um, and to, before it gets to um, Cena Cutson's Black Creek Preserve property, which is stunning, um, there's the stone barns that were part of Colonel Payne's estate. Um, and, and they're on the market again, and, and um, we just are looking for an, an easement. But that hasn't been finished yet. Working on it. Anything else? The 19th hole crosses Black Peak almost at its beginning. Where is uh, that? The 19th hole at Apple Greens. Oh, wow. In case there's any golfers here. And that's the same Black Peak that comes out across from Nori, where there's eels and eagles and all sorts of good stuff. Yeah. You should ask Dave about um, the eels and eagles. He he's um, he tracks them and, and bats, and he's he's a great resource. Joan, what? Here's a little gift. Thank you. <laughs> well, Joan, here's a little gift. We thank you for 
coming over the river to tell us more about your grandpa. We thought we knew a lot about him, but we, now we know a lot more about him. It's very, very interesting. Thank you very much for Thank coming. Thank you very much. It's been a great, great group. Is that right? Stay seated, please. Okay. Are we good? Yes. All right. Have a party then. Are you okay with your party? Thank you, Sue, very much. And I understand there's another really big event going on right now. So I just wanted to um, uh, to thank Joan. It was Absolutely. wonderful. If, if none of you, or if you haven't been to Slab Sides, oops, I'm sorry. If you haven't been to Slab Sides, that's the thing that really got me hooked. I think it's such a wonderful experience, and it's it's a shame that it's only open two times it a year. Not open just oh, did you not hear? It's open the second and fourth Saturday. June, July, August, September. But the building itself? It's open then, too. Oh, OK. And, and if you want to bring a group, your, your cousin from Wyoming, who's a big Burroughs fan, who wants to come, we're not open then, call us, email me. Um, we'll find a, a docent and, and let you in. And, Perfect. And you That's great. You have a Girl Scout group, you have a church group, you have a, you know. That's great. That's great. We, we'll get you in. And we aspire to be open every Saturday in 2021 when we celebrate our 100th anniversary. Perfect. Thank you. That was very informative. Um, so thanks to Joan, and thanks to everyone who has helped put this program on tonight. Um, my uh, co-chairs, John and Gloria Golden, uh, Randy uh, Soden, and John Bickford, who have been helping with our AV. Herb Sweet, who is recording this event in the back and will be posted on the church's website. So if you have any friends that have missed it tonight, you can um, go to the church website, and uh, probably within a day or two, it will be there, and you can um, hear the the, uh, the program. And then also Joanne Lown, who is coordinating our reception, which will happen shortly. I do have a couple of announcements, so I want to tell you. Um, I'm sure that you've uh, seen on the back of the program the list of the remaining chats. Um, from here on, they are all going to be on the first Thursday of the month. Um, if there is any cancellation, we need to have a snow day. It will be the following week. And I will try to have um, the cancellations posted on the three um, radio stations that are listed there and also uh, listed on the church uh, answering machines if there's any question. Uh, the one that I want to bring to your attention is the upcoming one on February 7th. Uh, this is going to be presented by our own Father Chuck, and he will be discussing the, the money trail uh, which has promoted slavery. Um, it's, it's a topic that hasn't really been discussed from this point of view, so I think it will be very interesting. So tonight, thanks to Joan, we've heard about her um, celebrated uh, great-grandfather. And we have another uh, special celebration tonight, that of our own John Golden. Uh, John, would you stand up? John is 95 years old today. John, John and his... John and his wife, Gloria, are responsible for the restoration of this chapel and the reading room, uh, making it possible for us to have our fireside chats here. So we thank them, of course, for that. And here to celebrate uh, with, with us is his daughter, Liz Hilton. And here she comes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. Happy birthday to you. So um, in a couple of minutes, please join us in the reading room for some cake and coffee and uh, chat with both Joan and uh, John. As Joan mentioned, she has some uh, books uh, there for you to purchase if you so choose and a good display. And um, I'm sure she'd love to hear your stories about, um, about the Burroughs uh, saga. So, so please join us. Give us a couple seconds to clear the chair and then please join us in the other room. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>